Hello, my name is Claire German and I'm the Managing Director of Design Centre Chelsea Harbour. I'd like to welcome you all to Focus 20 and today's conversation and design session. In this exciting new format, we're keeping our community engaged and inspired by bringing together designers, industry insiders and uh, media hosts for some great conversations online. We are simply delighted that world-renowned author, interior designer and creator of Ice Swoon, Athena Calderon, is joining us today. I have a hunch there'll be plenty to talk about, so there might not, might not be time for questions and answers. And who better to chair the session than Sarah Spateri, Editorial Director of Homes and Gardens. This promises to be such an inspiring and brilliant session. So without further ado, Sarah, over to you, and thank you all for tuning in. Hi there, and thank you very much, Claire. Um, as explained, I'm, my name is Sarah Spateri, and I'm Editorial Director of Homes and Gardens. I'm delighted to be here today hosting the first webinar for Focus 20. We are lucky enough to be asked to open the conversations in design programme every season. And I have to say I'm so impressed by the way that Claire and Becky and their team have pivoted to create this event that crosses the physical and the virtual. So yes, it's a delight to be here. So for today's session, I'm joined by Athena Calderon. Now it's hard to define Athena's career. She's a brilliant interior designer, turning her hand to creating beautiful homes and schemes with panache. She's an influencer. Her Instagram account has hundreds of thousands of followers. She's an author with two incredibly popular book, books and she's a podcaster. So today Athena is gonna share with us the secrets to her look and her interesting and her unusual career path. Hi Athena, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi Sarah, what a lovely introduction, thank yeah. you. Now Athena, tell us you're coming to us from the Hamptons today, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm at my home in Amiensit, um, which is almost the last town on the farthest east end of Long Island in the Hamptons. Now, um, before we get into your style, I thought it would be great to hear kind of where you grew up, how, you know, how you got started, how you moved into this, to this world. Yeah, um, I've definitely had a non-linear career path. I have always been a creative and um, I studied dance and I studied acting. Um, I went to college and university for dance and then moved to Manhattan to study acting and to model. Um, but nothing ever was quite precisely. I, I've always kind of been interested in creating experiences, but um, I don't know, in my early 20s, I hadn't quite found what it was that I was meant to offer this world. So I kept kind of trying a variety of creative verticals, which for many years I was really embarrassed of because I hadn't quite you know, found what it was I was meant to offer this world. Yeah. Um, but I also was kind of just absorbing like so many different, um, you know, opportunities. I was learning, I was growing. Um, and then I um, got married and had a baby quite young. Um, and most of my peers, most of my friends were kind of focused on their careers. And I found myself a little bit isolated and at home at the time. So I was in, my husband and I had just bought our first home in Dumbo, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and I was home often. And um, I really found that I um, was so full of, of so much heart and so much joy and love with my family life. But I've also, because I've always been a creative, I was um, losing a little bit of myself. So. Ooh you know, that was, that was a hard thing to kind of manage within my mind. You know, I had a beautiful home, a beautiful family, but I just wasn't completely whole without finding my, um, my place in the creative world. Yeah. So I decided to make my homes, to, to allow my homes to kind of foster this creativity within me. And that began um, in the kitchen by, you know, finding creativity and playing with flavors. And also I, I was traveling a lot at the time with my, with my newborn and with my husband who was an international DJ. And I was just seeing so much of the world and soaking in so much color and texture and flavors. And I would come home and just, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just wondering if there was sort of, if you can think of a, a moment when you were traveling where you kind of or a, or a experience that sort of you feel kind of fed that lifeblood that you're talking about because I completely understand that you know yeah. and how you absorb that and try and bring that to that sparkle to your own space 
Definitely. I mean, I, I remember being in Marrakesh and in Morocco and um, absorbing the, the sounds and the ceremony and the texture um, and, and new flavors that were so foreign to me. And I just remember feeling so invigorated to kind of bring some of um, some of these raw materials and these vibrant saturated colors into my home and also to instill ceremony for myself because like I said I was lacking something that you know I I, I would just pick and choose I, I remember you know being in um, in Spain and understanding like this concept of tapas at the time and never really knowing what that meant and you know coming home and inviting friends over and just making all these small little plates so I, I travel coincided with home in a really beautiful way that inspired both my love of kind of feathering my nest and designing my home and and also beginning my love of curation and collecting yeah. so that every place I went, I would, you know, bring something home that was imbued with so much memory and um, um, just, you know, I, I just love this idea of collecting things that really trigger something within you. And I was just yeah. starting to build um, that for myself and for our home. And that's really where my love of, um, of design really started was within my own homes. And it was in renovating, um, you know, doing small renovations and um, really starting to- I think that to... really nicely. You know, I think I'd love for, um, for us to sum up for everybody kind of the, the essence of your style. And I think you've started to touch on it there, but you know, you create these highly personal and very idiosyncratic rooms that, you know, aren't about trends. They're not about ticking boxes, but they do reflect this, you know, they, they generate emotions. And, you know, mm. here we are looking at your amazing kitchen in, I think, the home that you're in now. Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this space and the project here? Yeah, um, this is, uh, was a mid-century modern home. Um, I bought it almost uh, 11 or 12 years ago. And it's very rare in the Hamptons to find a mid-century modern home. A lot of the homes are far more traditional. And I just fell in love with the bones and the architecture, but the house really was kind of caving in on itself and mm -hmm. needed to be brought back to life. Um, but because it's almost all glass um, and you know can be perceived as more austere, I really wanted to ensure that I was using materials in the design that felt really simple and basic like rope that is lining the ceiling that you can see. Um, yeah. Just this is the type of rope that you can buy in any basic hardware store. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things I love about design is taking a very utilitarian, simple material, but using it in a clever engineered way. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, design is so much, like you said, it's about an emotion. I, I truly believe from my days of being a dancer to my love of, of setting a table and, and feeding people, I want to trigger emotion. I want you to walk into a space and not really know why you feel engaged or calm or curious, but that that is what you want good design to do. And it's all about a balance, right? You know, making sure some materials are slicker and harder paired with things that are a little kind of softer or more natural. Um, so I, I love, I love that polarizing contrast and yeah. kind of friction and the, the, the voltage that that creates in a space. And here we're looking at your Brooklyn, your Brooklyn home. Is that right? Yes, this is my Brooklyn. It's a townhouse. Um, again, that was a, a four story home that was broken up into a separate, um, separate apartments and um, I really dove into the um, the history of a Greek revival townhouse um, and brought back a lot of the um, kind of historical features and, and that was a fun challenge for me I'd never done a traditional home before. So was the just talk in the terms of timeline did you do the Hamptons project first? I did I did the Hamptons yeah. um, project first and I've um, in Brooklyn um, my husband and I have bought and sold almost 12 apartments and, and not because, and we've, and I've renovated at each one of them. 
And that's really where my design education came from. I mean, I did go back to school and take courses. I don't have a degree in design, but I took courses at Parsons. But it really was um, going through these projects and, and learning and also challenging myself to create yeah. something different with each project. And would you say there are any kind of key lessons that you've, you've learned over that time in terms of, you know, kind of as your style has evolved? Are there things that you do differently now or kind of anything that you can share as a sort of takeaway? Well, I think that I do try to avoid trends, but I think that it's impossible sometimes can, to not be kind of bitten by the bug of a trend. Yeah. You know, when I first did this house in um, the Hamptons, it was 2008 and we were kind of part of that, you know, reclaimed wood industrial antique movement. Um, and this house had a lot of that. And recently I did a renovation and, you know, um, I guess one of the things that I will say, just learning from this house in particular, is that if you have really good bones of a home, it's yeah. really easy to change paint colors or to put a texture of plaster on the walls or to, um, you know, the reclaimed wood that I mentioned to you was on a lot of the walls that, you know, my husband and I just like pulled down ourselves and then put some lime wash plaster over it. So I guess one of the things that I've learned is to kind of, you know, get crafty and to do things on your yeah. own sometimes because it's it's really fun to not only have that pride in your home, but I also think that it's fun to learn something new. Um, but I've also, I've just through my love of collecting antiques and vintage pieces, um, I, I think that uh, my homes do not feel trendy, even if there are some trendy elements, because I'm bringing in something that has this rich time-worn patina yeah, that adds something different to the house. It's not something you'll ever see in someone else's home. So I think that I would encourage people to just go to yard sales, go to estate sales, look at auction houses because, you know, someone else's junk can be your treasure. And I just love the idea of carrying on the history of something else in your space. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you do kind of very elegantly combine kind of the vintage with very beautiful, sleek, you know, modern products and great fabrics from, from great brands. I think, you know, we have a couple of more images we can look at to sort of which showcase your love of the artisan. I think that's something that I feel looking at your work, you know, that kind of narrative and sort of the warmth that we see with looking at your projects. Is this, yeah. and this one's in Brooklyn, this image, isn't it? Yeah, this is um, in Brooklyn and this is uh, a 1930s uh, Jacques Audenay console that was actually, um, when I found it, it was dark chocolate brown. And um, I sent it to my woodworker and I had him wow. strip it and bleach it. And so many people have said to me like, that was a really huge risk. Um, <laughs> and it was, but I mean, that's like, I, that's another thing that I would encourage people to do is to make something your own. If you see something that you like, maybe 90% of its characteristics, you know, you can change things, you can alter things. Um, even, even that um, sculpture that you're seeing right now, it's actually cracked. And I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have bought it because of that. And I'm like, oh, I mean, it just adds more character to it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I love this idea of buying vintage and, you know, giving it new life. And, you know, I love going to the D&D building in New York City and looking at fabrics from, you know, Pierre Frey or Kravit and, you know, reupholstering a vintage chair. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, I've found, you know, on, a, on Cherish, for instance, like a $300 chair, but put like a beautiful, you know, velvet or mohair, you know, fabric from Pierre Frey. So you, I love to kind of play with this high and low and, you know, Absolutely. creating my own uh, pieces. And there's quite a strong design community within New York, isn't there? Do you, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's really beautiful, actually, because I have really felt, especially because I started my career later in life, I have very much felt embraced by the design community. And um, I learn from all of my peers. And we really do all, we go to one another's openings. I'll never forget for my Brooklyn townhouse, um, I was so nervous because I knew Architectural Digest was shooting it. And um, 
you know, I brought in my friend uh, Giancarlo Valle, who's an incredible interior designer who was in my book. And, you know, him and I played around with some of the furniture and placement of things. Um, and, you know, Colin King, who's an incredible stylist, we met together styling my right. home for a shoot. And we all just, we support one another. We share one another's resources. You know, I'll ask, you know, do you have a great upholsterer? Because mine is unavailable. And there doesn't feel like there's this competitive thing. I mean, I'm sure there is a little bit, but it doesn't feel that way. It just feels yeah. like everybody is supporting one another. And, and also there's room, there's room for everyone. Everyone has their own point of view. Everyone has their own quirky ways of designing a space. So it's great to not have that um, competitive nature and instead have a supportive one. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's really beautiful about the design industry, which does move us really nicely onto Live Beautiful, your, your book. Yeah. Um, which came out earlier this year. Will you tell us a bit about sort of where the idea came from, how you source projects, you know, kind of obviously you're opening the door on some of these incredible designers' homes. So after that, you know, it'd be fabulous if you can talk us through a couple of, um, couple of the projects and why you love them. But yeah, firstly, if you just give a bit about the kind of, what's the common thread? Who, you know, who do you admire? How did you come up with the concept? Um, so yeah, the book is called Live Beautiful and um, I have always been an incredibly curious person. I want to know every, every creative journey, whether it's like how a song is made and what comes first, like the lyrics, the melody, the music, yeah. you know, I, I just always like to understand the creative inner workings of someone's brain. So, um, the idea really came because I feel as though I have just lusted over so many either friends, interior designers, or just designers work that I've seen on Instagram. And I just like, I always want to understand like, well, what was the first point of inspiration? What was, where did, you know, the, the vision for the room come from? Was there an initial piece that then kind of started your design journey? Yeah. So it was me being curious about asking them also because I know for myself, I know in this space, like the first, the first thing was the rope ceiling. And from there, it, you know, so many, like the, um, the alchemy of a room usually begins to take shape because of one piece. And it's like, it's building blocks, you know? And um, I think that that's really fascinating in design to allow yourself to be led piece by piece, material by material. So I, I just wanted to ask designers. I just wanted to have a chat with them. And being on set with some of these larger than life designers like, you know, Nate Burkis and Jeremiah Brent or Roman and Williams um, or Cine from Space Copenhagen, um, you know, Jenna Lyons. It was just so incredible to be on set with them. It was my favorite part, yeah. styling together, finding these people that get just as granular as I do about like the placement of something or understanding why this, they placed this, the artwork off-centered and how that, that composition made it just feel a little bit more engaging. Um, so it was kind of twofold, the concept of the book. One was understanding their process. Yeah. And then in a secondary approach, I also wanted to make the book feel really approachable to the reader so that as they were looking at this beautiful room that they might not ever be able to do precisely what this designer did, I wanted to, as the design expert, look at that image and distill down to what exactly was happening. What are the principles at play? Why does this room work? And how can I, in a little nugget soundbite, teach the reader something that they can feel a little bit more confident in designing their own spaces? Yeah, I think this democratization, um, you know, it's something that's very special and quite unique, you know, Obviously, it's it's a very it's a friendly in, industry, but it's nice for it to be also be an inclusive industry. And I think it's nice, you know, to try and distill and explain some of those. You know, they can look like hard to achieve rooms. I think if we move to the first one, which is a stunning living room by Apparatus um, yes. from the from the book, we've got to have a look at. And, you know, it's obviously a very uh, kind of expertly um, put together scheme with lots of layers. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if you, yeah, perhaps you could kind of try and distill for us um, 
you know, what, what it is kind of behind that design? Yeah, I mean, when I look at this room, they, they really weren't afraid to go with this concept of like geometry and shape. Right. And I think that the, the, the title of this um, caption might have been lean in, like lean into an idea rather than um, being afraid to be eccentric or, you know, to hold yourself back. Like if you're going to go with something, like go with it wholeheartedly because, um, you know, you look at this space and your, um, your eye just lands on so many things, but there is yeah. this common repeated thread that um, gives cohesion to the space, you know? So um, I just love the way the light is filtering through those very Prouvé inspired shutters. It's just so, it's so beautiful and eclectic and, and artful. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, I think it's the kind of surprising ideas. And as you say, the repeat of the geometric, which pulls it together, but you know, whilst also it does feel very confident and challenging. And yeah. so, and do you, I mean, you, you might know, is this in a, is this in a house, in a, in a house? This is um, in an apartment. This was a loft. Yeah. And, um, and it's a, is it by lighting brand apparatus? Yeah. Apparatus is the lighting brand and they're um, dear friends of mine, um, Jeremy and Gabriel, and um, they actually don't live here anymore. So I'm really happy that I got a chance to capture it before yeah. they moved. <laughs> they're really unusual. Um, and then we um, have one other one. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, Giancarlo Valle. He's an interior designer and architect and his wife, uh, Jane Keltner de Valle is the style director at Architectural Digest in the U.S. Um, and this is their, their dining room. Um, that's a light that is so beautiful and sculptural that he designed himself. Um, and I, you know, I just, it's just, I actually have like a, a deep connection to this space because this is um, the same apartment building that I first, my very first apartment I bought in was um, in, in Dumbo in Brooklyn. Yeah. And, um, I love this, uh, this feature in the book because they really made the space their own. They really kind of took a very industrial um, apartment and they, they made it feel so much warmer and added um, their own um, maybe atypical kind of uh, detailing to it. And, and I do really believe that um, you, 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 you need to make a space your own and you also need to sometimes or often not follow the rules of design. Yeah. You know, I remember he put these very traditional moldings on the wall with, you know, a loft ceiling that's very kind of concrete and obviously industrial. And I, you know, I just love that you can create your own, you know, visual statement in a space and sometimes toss aside the architecture and the history. Yeah, there's something between these two that we've looked at and also this one, it's something very sculptural in a lot of the pieces. I think. You know, I, I feel and speaking back to your furniture in your Brooklyn home as well. You know, there, there's something very beautifully sculptural. Is I that do. something that you think you're drawn to? Yeah, it, there definitely is. Um, I, I do love kind of A, nature and B, kind of, you know, a natural form, whether it's from a tree branch or whether it's like a curve. I, I am, I, I I'm always very cognizant when things feel too angular and I'm always yeah. wanting to engage something that feels a little kind of softer and sculptural. Um, this is um, Nate Burkus and Jeremiah Brent's home in Los Angeles. This is a meditation room that almost feels like it's outdoors, but it's not, it's indoors. And I love the, the clash of periods um, from you know the very traditional kind of settee bench to the very rustic, um, you know, farm-like table, and then this, you know, more 1930s, you know, traditional um, light fixture. I, I love this idea of, uh, of bringing together uh, many different periods and styles. Yeah, it's stunning, that one. The amazing yeah. floor as well. Um, and then we have uh, Jen Alliance, you mentioned, um, you know, obviously, I, I think, you know, anyone who's been on Instagram has probably poured over her home in the past. But I think that yeah. what you brought was, again, this really democratization of what she'd done and, you know, looking yeah. at the materials. And so this is her ensuite bathroom, is that right? Yes, this is her ensuite bathroom. And um, when, I mean, this bathroom is like just so spectacular yes. and that marble is so spectacular. 
and she designed um, the base of this um, of, of the vanity and it was brass and she did it knowing um, that she didn't want kind of shiny and new brass and she kind of spritzed repeatedly salt water on wow. the to allow it to oxidize faster and um, I I love this idea. I love that, you know, you can, yes, you can let something age over time and there's beauty in that, but I love that you, uh, you as a designer can also manipulate it should you choose yeah. to. And, um, you know, I think that this might have looked perhaps a little too, I don't know, glam and tacky and overdone if it was kind of shiny and new and um, this kind of green patina just makes the space in my opinion so yeah, I agree probably and I can imagine since publishing you found many many more spaces that you you know you have to do live beautiful too for us because oh my goodness I know some so wonderful my publisher wants me. I think we have one more I'd love to hear you um I'd love to hear you yeah. talk about um which is this is um Cine from Space yeah. Copenhagen um this is her apartment in Copenhagen and um what I love so much about this space and about learning about Cine's process was really about how she intentionally wanted all the floors to be dark and kind of recede and have the furniture and the, the sculptural shapes and forms of the furniture really pop against those floors or disappear because often she did black furniture on black floors and it's a way for you, again, as the designer to guide the eye to what you deem most important. Um, she also has an extensive art collection. So it was really important for her to have the, the walls be completely white and really have the art be, this is also her space, have yeah. the art be showcased against white walls. So um, I also love, this is a rental apartment and you know she, um, was able to just by changing the um, the floors and you know getting tricky with radiator covers. It's really an interesting idea of how you can really make a space your own, especially as an architect and a designer. Like she, even in a, a rental that she legally was not allowed to change very much by just changing um, small things, was really able to make it her own. Yeah, thank you so much. I can hear you talk through um, projects all day, but I'm just mindful of time and how yes, I would really love to talk about the, the Ice Wound lifestyle brand. I think, you know, and your career and how that's, how that's kind of changed and developed and grown over the years. So perhaps if you could take us back to 2012, yes. um, you know, when, when Ice Wound started and maybe also even give everybody a little bit of context about what actually Ice Wound is and, you know, yeah. what your plans are with it. For sure. Um, I soon really began as a way, I had just finished the renovation of this home. Yeah. And this home really changed everything for me because it not only challenged me, I worked with an incredible architect called Paul Massey from Bates Massey Architecture. And it was really the first time I worked with an um, incredible, highly revered architect. And it was also the first really large renovation project that I took on on my own. And I had such a wealth of information about resources and, you know, just how I approached the design. And simultaneously, I was hosting more and cooking more and entertaining more. And it just had started to become very apparent to me that even though I hadn't quite figured out my career, I had gone to culinary school and I had gone to design school, but I was in this in-between phase but I just had all this information and friends kept staying with me and asking about design advice for this or that, or yeah. can I have the recipe for this or that? So I swoon began because it was like all the things my eyes swoon over. I'm such a visual person from how I plate food or how I even choose my ingredients. I'm always thinking about color and texture and composition. And I started to realize that I approached design and food in very similar ways. Like, like I just said about making sure there's varied textures and varied um, and there's a lot of opposition on flavors in the same way in a palette of a room. So um, I soon started just as a way for me to share information with friends. And then it slowly, I, I had a couple of very lucky press opportunities 
um, with a, a Dumbo house and then this house that got published. And I was just mentioning iSwoon and it really just began to take shape. And um, I started it as um, a blog and slowly started to you know, work with a variety of brands and taking on kind of creative direction and developing recipes, but also shooting them in my environment. Um, and, and I just started to meet all these incredible photographers and stylists and it was just growing and expanding and I was so fulfilled. I was learning how to take photographs. I was learning about collaboration. I was learning how to be a creative director and dive into the DNA of a brand and turn that into something visual, into a photograph. And um, I just felt so fulfilled in the for, for the first time in my life. And I really um, leaned into this idea that I didn't really know where it was gonna go. And for years, it, I didn't make money from it, but I was just so happy. <laughs> And how, um, how do you, you know, it's obviously, it's, you know, from a blog to a kind of, as we call it, it's a lifestyle brand, you know, it, how, how does that shift happen? Is it something that you just build and you work and you graft and it grows? Or do you feel there was a milestone that kind of sort of was that step change or? Hmm. I think that um, for myself, it was a combination of the design and the entertaining and then beginning to work with beginning to take, have brands take notice of me and ask me to kind of be at the helm of creating a large scale event and invite not only my network, but also develop the recipes or hire a chef um, or, you know, set the tablescape. And um, I have a very high standards for myself. And I, I do feel like using my homes and my background in food and design, it just kind of became this, um, this storm of visual enticement for, um, for brands and also Instagram. Instagram was huge for me because it really helped me define and refine my eye and how I wanted to share things and capture things. Um, and it continues to grow and evolve um, every day. Yeah, and I know you've done recently, um, during lockdown, you've kind of tried to grow your video content. Um, yes. I think it's interesting again, and links back to what we've been talking about, this democratizing design and what makes a room work. Yeah, I, I have felt like there has been, obviously since we've all been in lockdown, a, a renewed interest more people are cooking than ever before and more people are in their homes as ever before. And I did have this moment where I was, I thought to myself, like, I have a lot to share, not only because I, I feel, you know, like I have a lot of information to share in my expertise in design and in food, but also it felt a little similar to my time being isolated at home in my 20s when I, um, when I felt at home a lot and I just wanted to begin to again distill information and share with people my approach my resources like telling people okay we're we're all in our homes right now how could we shop within our homes how can we restyle our bookshelves like showing people actually wiping the slate clean of my bookshelves and showing people my my thought process of how I pair things together and what and talking about why this composition works and why certain things don't work. So it really felt fun for me to step into this like almost teacherly role where I really shared information and, um, and people really appreciated it. And I do feel as though um, maybe not everybody is as forthcoming or shares information as much as I do. And I just, I, I want people to have what I'm having. Yeah. <laughs> Drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what, that kind of leads us on to, you know, what, what do you see as your you know, next steps? You know, would, would, we, would you be generous enough to do another book for us? Or, you mm -hmm. know, is it more video? Or what do you see as your next steps? Well, I am definitely uh, have a few opportunities in the TV space that I'm exploring right now, which are really exciting. Um, I'm about to shoot a sizzle reel for a production company that we've been in development of a, of a TV show idea that also um, is kind of about being more than one thing, which I am. I'm, I'm never, I've never been um, 
able to be into one category. And like I said earlier, I was embarrassed for that for a really long time. And it wasn't until I embraced that. So I'm just running with it. I'm running with like, not necessarily always knowing what to say when somebody says, well, what do you do? So um, the concept of the, this TV show is really about sharing all those multifaceted parts of my yeah. creative self. Um, but I also want to take what I have learned um, along the way um, in the visual realm and take my background in the culinary space and entertaining space and design space and create something tangible. So um, I'm, I'm in development of some product collaborations. Um, Fantastic. So yeah, yeah. I'm just, I, I'm, I think it's so it's so special the way that you sort of combine this kind of culinary and design expertise and every you know every kind of part of the joy of home is sort of touched with with what you do. Um, I suppose we haven't had we haven't got much time, but we haven't had much uh, of a chance to talk about your or any chance to talk about your podcast. I don't know if you if you oh, had yeah. anything to share about that as well because I think it's something that is again, very timely and, you know, the way that we connect with people is changing. And I think we're all looking for those conversations. So the reason that I really felt compelled to start the podcast more than one thing was because um, I really did struggle with being more than one thing. And there was a lot of shame around not being able to specifically identify with one career. Um, And slowly I started to embrace myself and it wasn't until that I embrace those multifacets that I found success. And I just felt that it was really important because I remember when I first started that people would send me a DM or send me an email saying, you know, how important it is and how much it meant to them that I, I, I do do more than one thing. And, and um, not everyone has a very linear path to what they want to do. And um, I think that it's so important to tell our stories of our roadblocks and of our uncertainties and how we choose to push past that. And um, also to have these very successful people like Jenna Lyons, for example, who, you know, her episode, she was just so raw and honest about how challenging it was when this phone stopped ringing after this career that she identified her life with for I think over 20 years was suddenly gone and how she had to rebuild her own self-esteem and her own creative confidence. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's so important for people to hear other people's stories because you can look at my life and my homes and think, you know, it wasn't a bumpy path and that's just not the reality. So I just find it really important for people to, you know, share their truths, share their stories, and hopefully to allow it to give somebody the confidence to take a risk. Yeah, and I have to say, um, you know, we haven't got much time. So I, I thank you so much for being so generous and so open with us today on, you know, the journey. And I think there is something very special and sort of idiosync- idiosyncratic about the rooms that you create, and they all have a, a narrative and a warmth. And I think hearing your hearing your story kind of adds that extra flavor and depth to what you do. So I really, really appreciate your generosity and you know all the design ideas, talking us through the designers as well. It's very rare to have people um, have experts talk you through the DNA of a room. So I, I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for your time. Yes, of course. Thank you, Sarah. I love talking with you. So yeah, me too. It was great to meet properly. Thanks, Athena. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.